little while, we have been dealing with this thought of who you say I am. And each week I have asked these questions. Where do you go to be validated about your work as a person? That's very important because as you were saying in the video, if we try to go to other people, then we always have to live up to expectations. Or other than we have to try to achieve to do more. I mean, do you try to find it in a job? Or in a relationship with someone? In the beauty of your appearance? In education? In your possessions? In popularity? In financial success? Where do you go to be validated about who you are as a person? And I've been all through this, I've been trying to encourage you to understand we need to find our validation, who we are as beings, and who you, the all capital letters out there, who you say I am. And again, you notice I have it up there. And I said each week, all that can be summed up in the next slide, which has the he greater than I, which is referring to where God must become greater and we must become less. It's all about Jesus Christ. Again, as Benny saying, because he lives, it's all because of Jesus Christ being alive, we have this hope. Who you are needs to be and must be found in him. And like I said, the first when we first started dealing with that, sort of gave me an outline of what we we're going to be doing. And each week we went over this too. We, we talked about how we were dealing with I am love. He says I am love, that I'm a child of God. God is pleased with me. We are God's masterpiece. We are a chosen people. We are royal priests. We are a holy nation. We are God's very own possession. He called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. We can show others God's goodness. And again, as I shared earlier, my desire as we go through this is to arm you with the ammunition that you need to battle the enemy when he comes against you or it comes against you to try to question who you are. Especially being a child of God. We need to understand the enemy is going to try to tell us we're something that we're not. He's going to constantly try to tell them, oh, is that really you? We need to understand who we are so we can battle that enemy. Whether the enemy is the devil, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's fear, whether it's doubt, any such thing. We, we need to understand. So again, as each week I encourage you, be excited about finding out who you are, about who God says that I am. Amen? Last week, we were dealing with the, the thought of we are chosen. I told you, let's make it personal. Each week, the we's up there try to turn into say, say this about I because it's a lot of times, and I explain it, a lot of times it's easy for us to declare we are chosen or we are royal priests because in that, sometimes when we say that, we're not necessarily including ourselves, but we believe it about others around us. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why I said sometimes we've got to say make it personal because this is for everyone who is a child of God. Yes, it's for us as a group and as a whole, but it's for you individually. The last week we were dealing with the fact that I said we, we are a chosen people. I sure said we need to say that I am chosen. I am chosen. Understand it. You are chosen. And I, 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 I talked to you about it. You know, um, I'm just going to give a little, little, little brief recap here. But remember last week I was talking about how, you know, who's here ever, you know, when you were, when you were younger, even as an adult, maybe played sports, and all of a sudden you had to choose sides. And, and what they do usually? They usually pick usually the two best people or the two most well-known people. They say, okay, you're this side, this side, now. <laughs> what, what, what do they begin to do? They begin to pick. They begin to choose people. And usually what happens is, if you're, if you're at the end of the line down here to be chosen, the last one to be chosen, usually look, that means you're probably not very good at what you're getting ready to play. Very rarely do they save the best for last because they want to get the best for themselves because they want their team stacked. Okay? But with God, and that's what I'm trying to understand, this, help you understand, this, with God, when God chooses you, and I, and I sort of shared this at the end of the when I said, you know, God chose you, Yvonne, but also He chose you, Will, but because He may have chose Yvonne first doesn't mean He likes you any less. He, he, he wants you just as badly as He wants Yvonne. And, he, and, and Kathy, He chose you, but because He maybe chose you after Yvonne and Will, that, that doesn't mean He likes you a lot better. He wants you just as badly as he wants them. See, when God chooses, we need to understand. It. It's not like we're, we don't have, we're not second rate. Right. So, so understand, so, so when I say that, if we're getting ready to get into some of the stuff we're getting into this morning, what we're going to be talking about today is that we are royal priests. Understand, you're nothing less than anybody else around you. 
Yes, I may be a minister of the gospel, and there's some responsibility upon me, but I am no greater in the kingdom of God than you. If you, you understand what I'm saying? This, this is the role that he's placed me in. There's other roles that he wants you to be in. And honestly, no role is really great. It's, it's all about being a believer in him and doing and fulfilling the role and the purpose that he has called us to be. But as we get into this, understand, being a royal priest isn't just my calling. It's your call. It's what he wants you to do. Okay? So like, as I said this week, we're talking about we are royal priests. But again, let's make it personal. And let's declare this point if you ready to start. I am a royal priest. Ready to say it with me? I, I am a royal priest. priest. Say it again. I am a royal priest. I am a royal priest. Understand that. Where we get that from is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I am going to read these verses this morning, even though I did not read them last week. But I want you to understand, as he goes through all of this stuff, uh, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, here we go. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you receive no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. So understand, the fact of the matter is that God sees you and me as royalty. Because that's what he declares here through Peter in this portion of Scripture here. The question is, do you view others and yourself like that? Do you truly see yourself as being royalty, as being a royal priest? I'm going to break them each down, but do you see yourself as being royal this morning? And why would you live any less than how God sees you? See, that is, that is where we come in a lot of times. We don't live up to how God sees us. And, and, and what I mean by that, it, it's not, it's not, it's just that we just don't believe a lot of times that when he says that we are truly forgiven, we don't believe we are. Or that we're blessed, we don't, we don't believe that we are. And see, what I want to do as we go through this, I want you to, to live up to what God says about you. Not that you're trying to earn anything. That, that, that's not what I'm talking about this morning. But I want the realization of what God says and what His Word declares of you. You can say, that's for me. And you can grab a hold of it and live it and walk in it. So, so, so understand that. It's not about you trying, trying, to, trying to live up to a checklist of standards, but truly understanding that God has declared this over you, and because of that, you can live that. Sort of like, you know, I, we, we, you know we, we were sort of talking about this out in the foyer this morning. I was maintaining a little different direction. But this little uh, uh, banner over here says, so if the sun sets you free, you are truly free. You notice there, it's a chain being broken. I understand. Jesus Christ paid the price to make you free. But it's up to you to whether or not you want to live in that freedom. You can continue to live being bound by things. You continue to let certain things hold you down and tie you back. But the thing is, understand, in Jesus Christ, if you truly believe in Him, He's declaring, I have set you free. So the question is, will you walk in that freedom or won't you? So this morning, the Word of God declares that we are royal priests. We are royalty. Will we live in that? Will we walk in that or won't we? You understand where, where, where I'm going with this? I hope you do. Because, again, this, God sees you and me as royalty. But do we truly see ourselves in others that way? And why would you live any less than how God sees you? That's the thing. This is the thing. As long as we are looking at ourselves the way that God sees us, we're not looking at ourselves wrong. Because that is truly the, the, the full potential that you can ever be. The greatest thing about God is He can see who you can become before you ever even have the thought of it. He knows exactly if you, if you would just allow Him to truly come in your life and let this truth and this freedom grab a hold of you, what you could be at the end of it. And it's a matter of just getting back and trusting Him. Amen? I want to, I want to share a story with you that's uh, in the Bible. I don't have a scripture reference for it today, uh, but it's just a story I want to share. In the Bible, we're introduced to a character whose name is Mephibosheth. 
Oui, non, c'est derrière quoi, Monsieur, monsieur. 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 He was the youngest son of a person by the name Jonathan. And Jonathan happened to be the oldest son of a person named Saul. And I'm not talking about the Saul who became Paul. I'm talking about the other song of the Bible. Who's the other song of the Bible we talk about? King Saul. He was the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel. He was the first king. But Meshemeshef was, 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 was the youngest son of Jonathan. Well, Jonathan and David had a very, very special relationship. The Bible says that, 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 they, that they had a great love for each other, a love that, that, that exceeded the love of women. Basically, uh, and, and, they, and they actually, they, they respected each other, loved each other so much, that they literally became what, what, we, what we could probably more easily understand is they became like blood brothers. Basically, they, they, they took the note with each other, and they said, look, you know, if anything ever happens to me, I'll take care, you take care of my family, if anything happens to you, I'll take care of your family. In other words, whatever, whatever was one person's was the other's, and whatever the other person was theirs. Other than they, they made that type of bond and a type of covenant together. So, so, so this is the type of, of relationship that David and Jonathan had. Well, one day the Philistines came to attack Israel, and in that battle, King Saul was killed. Jonathan was killed, along with all of Saul's other sons. And usually what happens when that kind of stuff happens, um, people begin to go through and try to um, clean house of a royal family. And when the news reached the town where Meshivachev was living as an infant, as a young child, that his handmaid, his, his nanny, his caretaker, when she received the news, she became scared, so she grabbed Meshivachev and she began to run. And as she ran, she fell. And when she fell, she fell on him and caused his legs to become crippled. To where, from a very young age, Meshivashev was, was a cripple. Yeah, he, 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 he had to get problems getting around. Yeah, he, he, he couldn't walk well and all that stuff. Uh, he just, what happened? But the thing is, she took him, because of everything that happened, she took him to a place called Lodabar. She took him to a town called Lodabar. And let me, let me tell you, what the Bible, what the name Lodabar means. Lodabar is one of the most poverty-stricken, desolate cities in the entire region. The very meaning of its name is not having or no pasture. Other words, it was a town of forgotten people, including Meshivashev. So there was Meshivashev. That's where he lived the majority of his life. Now think about it. He was the grandson of a king, and he was living in poverty. And whether you, this sinks in or not, many times that's exactly how we live our lives, as being believers in Jesus Christ. We are royalty, but many times we are living in complete poverty. We forget who we are in Jesus Christ. When David su succeeded Saul and became king, years later, he remembered his covenant that he had with Jonathan. And he says, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I can show, show be gracious to, that I can honor Jonathan, my friend? And it came back that Jonathan did have a son, and his name was Meshivashev. And he said, and so David Simper says, Go get him and bring him to me. Now, you got to understand, remember, let, let's look at the story of David and Saul. Remember David King Saul? <coughs> Towards the end of Saul's life, what was Saul trying to do for, for, for last of Do what now? He was trying to kill David. He was pursuing him all over the land of Israel, seeking to kill him. He had people say, give up, say, you know, you, you, you need to turn against him. No matter how good David's been to you, you see him, you better tell me about it. You know? He said, he said you better turn him in. So I guarantee you, when Meshivashev heard this word, he's thinking, oh man, the king wants to see me. And my grandfather, my grandfather, you know, he, he, he went after him a lot trying to kill him. And, and you know, when, when, he, when, he came, when he came before David, he came before David worried. He was nervous because 
you know, in his mind, he, 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 what, you know, what's it, is the king going to now, is he going to continue to resact revenge on our family because of what my grandfather has done? But when Meshivashev came into the presence of King David, David says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because I remember the covenant I have with your dad. And because of the relationship of your dad and me, I'm going to bless you. The fact is, I'm going to restore all the lands that belong to your grandfather. I'm going to give them back to you. And in fact, I'm going to allow you, you're going to be fed at my own personal table. Now that sounds pretty neat, doesn't it? That's pretty cool. But do you really understand how much of a stretch that was back in that day? What was Meshivashev's condition? He was, he, he was lame. He, 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 was, he, he wasn't perfect. And in those days, to be in royal courts, they, they didn't want to see people coming to royal courts be hobbling around on canes and all that stuff. So as far as, because of what happened to the ship itself as a child, truly he wasn't worthy to be in the royal court. He definitely wasn't worthy enough to sit at the king's very own table and eat with him. But yet David remembered his covenant with Jonathan. He remembered that and he, because of that, and he knew that Jonathan, Jonathan Willing was ready to, to let the, the, uh, the king should go aside and give it to David. If you know anything about the story, he was willing to do that. And David knew this. And he overlooked all that stuff and he blessed the shepherd shepherd. Oh, he, he wanted to let Meshavashev know. He said he wanted him to realize that you are still royalty. You are still valuable. See, Meshavashev didn't see himself that way anymore, even though he knew he was the grandson of the king. Like I said, he lived in poverty and squalor. I'm even sure he may have known about, depending on how old he was, he may have heard stories about how David and his father Jonathan were friends and the type of covenant they may have had and how much his father loved David. But, you know, but, but if that's the case, if he knew this, why didn't why did Meshavashim go to David and say, hey, I know, I know the relationship you have with my father David. Why don't you do something for me? He never did that. He, 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 was, he willingly settled for mediocrity. All the while knowing he was royalty. He refused to live up to the royalty of what was declared of him because of who he was related to. And then I, I broke this question down. So why do believers settle for mediocrity when we are children of the King of Kings? Why do we so much seem like all the time do we allow the enemy to come in and truly speak lies over our life and we accept it as true? And the things, you, one thing you say, well, Pastor, how do you know what he's speaking lies? Because here's what Jesus said about the enemy. Here's what Jesus said about the devil. He says he's the father of lies. And what else? What do you follow it up with? And there is no truth in him. See, 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 the devil, the enemy, he always speaks a portion of the truth, but it's never the complete truth. It, it's always followed up with something that's false. So which, in return, makes it what? Makes it a lie. He makes it sound just true enough to make you think it's true, but then he has to add this other stuff in that makes it false. I, I try to give kids, kids this type of thing about if you ever take a test. True, false question. It's amazing how sometimes they'll word it to where you say, yeah, that can be true. See, right there you just answered your question. Yeah, that, that can be true. It sounds like it could be true. And then when you have the doubt, automatically mark it as false. Unless you know that it's true, it's false. Because how, how much falsehood has to, be to, has to come to truth to make truth false? Any amount. Any amount of anything... Any falsehood in a, in a truthful statement makes that statement now false. But the truth is always the truth. It's always the truth. One hundred percent the truth. You've heard me. You've heard me talk about this. Uh, you know, I always compare it to ivory soap. You know, they always talk about pure ivory soap. It ain't pure. It's ninety nine point nine whatever percent pure. Which means since it's not one hundred percent, you're putting some type of junk on your body you ain't supposed to have. It ain't pure. You have to try to make the spill go by saying it's 99.9. .9. It's the devil. No, it's, no I'm not saying that it's the devil. Um, but I want you to understand, you know, the truth is always the truth. 
But, many, but too many times we listen to what the devil says instead of what God says. And he declares that we, through the word of God, through you, he declares that we are royalty. We are royal priests. In Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, we use these verses several times in what we've been dealing with so far. But, but I, want to, I want to bring them out again today, which, which declares again that we are royalty. It says, For you are all led by the Spirit of God who are for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you, you have not received the Spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba Father. For His Spirit joins with our Spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share His glory, we must also share His suffering. Now again, that's a whole, that last sentence there is a message for a whole other time. We could go off on a tangent knowing that, but I'm not going to go there today. What I want you to understand is what that's declaring. It says, because we are children of God, we are His heirs. We are joint heirs with Christ. So, what does that mean? It means, how Christ is, we are. What He gets, we get. Except for the King, King, Lord, Lord, part, which brings us this. Who is Jesus? Jesus is, the Bible declares him, he is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. So, if he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that means he himself is royalty. Am I right? He's royalty. So, if we have been adopted into that family, and it says that we are now God's heirs, that we are now joint heirs with Christ, and we know the Bible says that Jesus is the King of kings, and the Lord of Lords, which means we're now related to Him, and He is royalty. What does that make us? We are royalty. See again, I, I wanted you to, I wanted you to see this and understand it because it's important. Too many times again, it's easy for us to maybe see it in somebody else, but understand, you being a child of God this morning, you are royalty. You are royalty. But. <coughs> Peter didn't stop there. I'll get there in a second. You are an heir of God. You're an heir of God of the entire universe. You are a joint heir of Jesus. That means, like I said, whatever God promised him, he promises you. So you are royalty. But we are not only royalty, we are royal priests. Now understand what a priest is. Now, a lot of times we correlate with the Bible says a priest, we correlate with a modern day minister. And that's not really necessarily case, but, but it is. But when we sometimes view a minister, we view it differently. We, we, we say, well, pastor, you're a minister. I'm just a lay person. I'm just a contender. I'm just a member of the church. No, you, you, you are a royal priest. You are a royal minister. Okay? What is a priest? Peter tells the believers that they are, they are, they are now ordained with the role of a royal priesthood mediating God and Christ to many nations. An ancient priest was to be sanctified and set apart from the people at large for his ministry to the deity to whom he had special access. This means that you are set apart for Jesus and have access to God. And this access is not only for you, but for others as well. Fulfilling the role of a royal priest is not easy to do, but God will never command you to do something in which you will not be victorious. Oh, he will give you the ability to do this. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you here. In order to fulfill the role of a royal priest, this means you, have, you, you are to do acts of praise, deeds of kindness, sharing of goods, have acceptable conduct, and proclaim the gospel. That's what really being a priest or being a minister is about you as a believer in Jesus Christ. You have been called to a ministry of proclaiming the gospel, of living this life, of living who Jesus is in front of those around you, of doing good to them, of living in a life that, that, that truly shows that you have a relationship with the Lord. That's really what, that's simply what it means. But it truly is an awesome responsibility. And, and it's something he said that, that, that you have the ability to do because that's what God calls you. So he declares that you are royal priests. And what you need to do, 
How can I sit there perform these duties? How can I be a royal priest of those around? Again, when you were saying royal priest, that doesn't mean you're up above anybody else. It just simply means that, that you're a servant. You're there to declare who God is to those around you. Who Jesus is and what He's done and share that with you. And understand, Peter says that you are that. You, you're a royal priest. You're part of the family of God and you're, you're to, to declare this to those around you. See, God has given us a high calling with the same authority that Jesus had on earth. Since Jesus has gone to the Father, Jesus says that we can do the mightier things than He did because He's now in the presence of the Father. Remember Jesus did say in John, for greater works than these shall you do because I go into the Father. Now think about it. That's sort of mind-boggling, isn't it? Mind-boggling. That Jesus, I mean, can anybody tell me some things? Because let's think about this for a second. Can anybody tell me some things that, that, that Jesus did when He was on this planet? He raised the dead. He raised the dead, all right? What else did He do? He healed the sick. Sick of all sorts. All right? What else did He do? He turned water to wine. What else did He do? Cast out demons. What? He healed the blind. Again, we talk about healing the sick. Healed the blind. Had the lame walk. Withered hands be made whole. Uh, issues of blood that have that, been bugging this lady for 12 years. Instantly dried up, she was healed. I mean, he, he, he did a lot of things. And now, now understand, he fed 5,000 plus with five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. He's not going to tell him. And now I'll see. <laughs> you mind you bring up to 5,000 with, with uh, five loaves and two fish? Sure. <laughs> see, 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 see that, that's what I'm trying to get you to understand. When we truly understand who Jesus is and who we are in Him, if He opened that situation, that's exactly what He'd be able to allow us to do. Why? Because He said it. He said, this is what would happen. Like I said too many times, as Whitney Bond said, we don't see ourselves the way that God, when God declared to open us. And I'm hoping as we go through this series, your mind gets changed and understand who He says you are. And let the impossible become possible in your mind. Because he is the God of the impossible. And when he says that we are royal priests, can you understand? We are connected to his family because of Jesus Christ. And whatever Jesus did, we do. And Jesus said all this stuff. And what Jesus did, we can do. And he says even greater things than Jesus. Some people try to say, well, more numerous. The bottom, I don't care if it's more numerous or not. The bottom line is, hey, to do what I was just seeking, I sort of pulled that one out of my hat because. I don't know if I've ever recalled reading in history where um, a believer has gone around and done that type of feeding, but I have heard this type of thing. I've had heard the type of thing. I remember Betty telling a story about her dad. He was, he was out ministering somewhere far away. He knew he didn't have enough gas to get back from where he was to Baltimore, and he just put it in God's hands. He said, Lord, I just put it in your hands. And the car ran out of gas. If I remember the story right, you're telling me. Just as he got, because your, your, your home was on, on a slight little hill, just as he got to the top of the hill, it ran out of gas and allowed him to drip down to the front of the house. God brought him all that distance on what he knew wasn't enough <laughs> from the human standpoint. Then you understand. See, God is the God of the gospel. He's able to do things. See, that, that, that's just one story. Again, let your mind become open to who God says you are. And let Him truly just rock your world and in return when He rocks your world, He's going to rock the world of the other people around you. And it's not about declaring how great you are, but it's going to be showing how great He is to bring honor and glory and praise to His name. So grab a hold of this saying here and it says that we are a royal priesthood. That we are a royal priest. And understand, we have been called. We're part of that royal family. We have been called to declare the goodness of who our Father, our King is. Because you know, even though Jesus Christ, in the Bible declares He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, the time is coming when Christ Himself 
Once Christ has subdued all other things on the earth, he will submit it all to the Father, then Christ himself will submit himself to the Father. Other things, he'll give what the Father gave him, he'll give it back to him. And God will truly reign. The Father reigns King of Kings. We have an awesome heritage through Jesus Christ. And I just want you to grab a hold of that and understand that. You are going to this morning. You are special. You are a masterpiece. You are chosen. As I said last week, when we looked at that about Jesus coming and asking disciples, telling him, come follow me. In other words, a rabbi choosing him. We already know by how that process was done. They were already told in their life they were not good enough to follow a rabbi. But Jesus said, come and follow me. Because in other words, when Jesus looks at this, he sees what we can be. If only we'll look to him and model our life after his life. He's saying it's not too late. You can be something great in me. You can be just like me. Because I see it in you. But you have to follow me. And that's what this whole, we, we, as we dealt with all of that, that, that's what we talked about last week. So, we are royal priest. So I'm going to close with a portion of scripture we open the message with. I'm going to ask our musicians to come get in place. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people, a royal priest. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others God, the goodness of you the goodness of God who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. We have been chosen. And because of that, we are now royal. We are royal priests. So get this. God has declared that you are his. God has given you a high calling with the same authority that Jesus had on earth. Let that sink in. As a royal priest, you get to proclaim the greatness of God, your Father, to those around you. You know, sir, you get to proclaim. You have the honor to share how awesome God is. And as you step out in faith and do that, He will give you the ability to do that and you can impact lives for Him by fulfilling the role that He declares over you that you are a royal priest. So don't let the devil tell you anything different. As the old, I think it was the old army slogan was, be all what? Be all you can be. Be all you can be. And Tom talked about how we're in the army of God. Be all you can be for Him. And here's the greatest thing about it. He'll do the work. He'll come in and let the power come. You just have to believe what He says about you. And when you do that, You'll be able to do some mind-blowing things. And it's been made available to you. Just reach out and receive it. Don't be like Meshavishet and settle for mediocrity. I mean, he went from a zero to royalty real quick because of what David offered. Because of Jesus, the same offers to us. Understand who we are in Jesus. Do you want to live in mediocrity? Or would you rather truly be around the kingdom? Lord of Lords, taking up what He has, what He declares, and what He says. A choice to choose. As a, I was thinking about closing the message today, I said, you know, what can I tell them at the end to really help them understand this or, or encourage them? Understand what it says in that portion of scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. He says, We are chosen people, our royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. 
And I'm, I'm going to skip over the one part there. It says, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Then added it. Because of all of that, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Because of everything he declares about you, declares over you, when you truly grab a hold and understand it, you can truly declare to others and show to others the goodness of God. You're not second rate to anybody else in here. You're not second chosen, third chosen, fourth chosen. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not of, of, a, of a lower royal class. You're joint heirs with Jesus. Understand your potential in God. You, Jesus, says you're in worth with Jesus. And let Him truly come down and do the work in your life that He really wants to do. The only one who limits what God does in your life is you. <coughs> live, live up to or, or allow what He declares over you to come to full fruition in your life. Let it fully come alive and be all that you can be. In Jesus. Amen. Stand with us this morning. And maybe you're well, Pastor, what can my message be? What can I tell people? Well, this song's called Who Can Satisfy. We can either turn it personal or we can turn it to the people or we can proclaim somebody else. We can proclaim somebody. Who can satisfy Jesus. your soul? like Him. Who? Who can do these things but Him? And then you be declared, there is a country. You love that there is hope. There is hope. And His name is Jesus. So so I, I believe let this song lift you up and encourage you, but let it also let it be your message to declare to the world that there is a King who loves us. He's there to reach out and do things in our lives and minister in our lives. Amen? So let's just worship the Lord as we close this morning. If you feel the need to pray, the altar is open to you. And I will gladly pray for you. Whatever the need may be, it may be about the message, maybe something else is going on. I don't know. But all I know is God is still in the prayer answer business. Uh, he still heals. He still touches. He still moves. He still encourages. He does that. But I want I want to just, in this time, I want just give him praise and declare that there is no one who can satisfy my soul like you. And that's the message we want to take to this world. Drugs won't do it. Alcohol won't do it. Your job won't do it. Money won't do it. The only one that's going to satisfy is Jesus. Amen? He's the only one. So let's sing to him this morning. Who can satisfy?